morning. Buongiorno. My name is Alvaro Sánchez. Uh, I come from, from Spain, from Madrid. Um, I'm here, hola, I heard hola over there. Ciao. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the, uh, something I'm calling the front-end revolution and how that affects you and how can you uh, embrace it and, and liberate it. First of all, Some words uh, about me. I consider myself a software developer. Uh, in the first phase of my career, I worked for um, companies like uh, IBM or BA Systems or some microsystems in training. Uh, Java developer, basically. I created my own company in uh, 2005, a services company. Uh, but after several years, I gave up. Uh, try to do something else, and today I work at uh, Adobe uh, as a developer or architect or whatever you call it, it doesn't matter. Um, living between uh, Madrid and uh, Gibraltar. Uh, you guys call that uh, Gibraltar or something like that? So, 10 seconds to explain what we do at Adobe. Uh, we are creating an uh, HTML5 platform for uh, gambling games. You know, games for casinos, slot machines, uh, card games, table games, uh, dice games, that sort of things. So the idea is that, uh, say you want to create a game, um, uh, online game for, for, for uh, let's say, uh, Bet365. So you create this slot machine and then you need to integrate with them to share the players, to integrate with the authentication system. And if you do that, you cannot do the same thing for Betfair because they have different systems, right? So. Uh, what we do is we have a transparent platform where you can put your game. Uh, so you create the game once and you can put it on all the casinos we have agreements with. Um, you can take a look at play.com uh, and try some games for free. They are, uh, they are the first HTML5 games in the industry. So you can play with your uh, mobiles, with your iPads, iPhones or whatever. Well, um, as I told you, I'm here to talk to you about the front-end revolution, and I will talk about that uh, from two different points of views. First of all, for, from a human resources point of view. So um, we have some full-stack frameworks, a uh, lot of them. I know you guys probably are familiar with at least one of them. So if you are familiar with at least one of them, please raise your hand. Cool. So, um, as you see, we have JVM frameworks, we have PHP, in that slide we have Rails or Python uh, frameworks, but all of them more or less have one um, feature in common. They are monolithic, and I will explain what this means. Uh, monolithic, from this point of view, means that um, Fundamentally, the views and the business logic is packaged together. So you have one package, uh, for instance, if we talk about the JVM framework, you have a word file, and inside the word file, you put the, your views, your business logic, you put everything, right? When you have to create a new version of your application, you, 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 you have to recreate that word file and redeploy everything together, right? That means monolithic. In this case, the, the views are server-side generated, so that's basically the definition of a uh, JSP or a PHP, right? It's a server page, whatever server page, or ASP is a server page. So uh, it's server side generated. With that in mind, uh, means that full stack frameworks require full stack developers. So a uh, full stack developer is basically 
a guy of a girl or a girl who is able to write code in theory, and I say in theory, on every layer, every tier of the application. So let's do an experiment. Um, I want you guys to take your mobile or your tablet or your uh, uh, devices and go to that URL and answer one question. This is a live poll. I've never done, done this before, so I don't know if it will work or not. So I will give you a couple of minutes to answer the question. The question is essentially, how do you see yourself as a developer? I want to know in this room is if you feel like a full stack developer or a front end or back end developer. Uh, there is a fourth option in, in, in the poll and you will see right now. So grab your mobiles. Is it working and loading? No. Okay. Sorry, I lost the Wi-Fi connection on my laptop, but I will post the, the results of the poll later on Twitter, okay? So, um, so as I told you, um, let's do it, let's say, manually. So who, do you, who feels like a front-end developer, pure front-end developer? Well, a few people. Who feels like a pure back-end developer? Uh, who feels like a backend developer with some sort of uh, CSS and JavaScript knowledge, but very little? That's the majority, I believe. And who feels like a full stack developer, proficient in all details? Quite a few. So if you, if you search over the internet, you will see, uh, for instance, Facebook. Um, Facebook is um, totally um, obsessed by hiring full stack developers because they believe that uh, people who is able to work on every single tire it's, it's a, a good idea. And uh, I, in principle, I agree. So uh, I agree with that if, I mean, having full stack developers is great if, if they are actually able to do that. But if the reality is a different one, so if the reality is that uh, that full stack developer, but full stack developer is essentially a backend developer. Uh, is where he feels more comfortable, and then he knows, you know, uh, very basic CSS 
hacks and tricks and you know how to move one pistol up, one pistol down, left, right, and then it's okay. Uh, you use the console for that and that's all what you know about that. Uh, you think you know your JavaScript but you don't, you know your query, which is a different thing, right? So knowing properly JavaScript is a, it's a different subject. So uh, if that's the reality, I don't think that's really good, right? So, uh, and that even makes less sense when your company has truly front-end developers. And when I mean truly, I'm talking about people who is only, um, people who is basically uh, skilled with JavaScript, with HTML5, with CSS3, and that sort of things. And those people is coming. They are coming. And that's what we call the front-end revolution, right? Uh, and it's a revolution because we've never seen this before. We've never been uh, watching a lot of front-end developers uh, let's say, in the communities. So let me tell you about some facts about this revolution. Um, I think you guys may agree with me if I say that the JavaScript community is huge. Uh, I don't know, here in, in Italy, but in Spain, is huge community. So the JavaScript conferences, the JavaScript meetups are really crowded, a lot of people out there. Because if you think about that, um, there's JavaScript developers on every, on every single platform, right? So the .NET developers also use JavaScript. So uh, there is a lot of people uh, around uh, that language. There is a second fact. Node.js is becoming highly popular. It's you know, the, new, the new tool for, for uh, hipsters, right? So if you have to do something today, you have to do it in Node.js because otherwise you won't be cool, right? You won't be um, you know, will in Java or any other language feels like uh, odd. And the third fact is that there is a lot of tools built around Node.js and JavaScript, and those tools are becoming more and more popular. So I will display you some pictures. How many of you are aware of these tools or frameworks? Does that sound familiar to you? Not many. So we have. Um, AngularJS, Ember, and Backbone, they are um, JavaScript MVC frameworks. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, concept. So we're talking about JavaScript MVC, uh, but at the beginning I talked about server-side MVC. So the reality is that we are moving to having the MVC in the browser, right? Not in the server. And that's, it, that's a, a huge, huge shift in the way we usually uh, create applications. So that means that we have client-side controllers, we have client-side views, and that sort of things. And we use uh, a REST API on the server just for you know, things like storage or communication, uh, et cetera. On the second row, we have the famous tools around these things, and we have Yeoman, which is essentially uh, a combination of Grant and Bower. Grant is uh, a build system in JavaScript, so it's a replacement to, to if you if you wish, it's a replacement for a Maven or Gradle or whatever. And Bower is a package manager. It's uh, it makes easier for you to to specify dependencies. For instance, you can say. I need AngularJS 1.2, I need Twitter Bootstrap 3.0, stuff like that, and he will take care of dependencies. Uh, he will load them and make them available for your application. <laughs> and all of these tools are tools that the front-end developer will love, right? So uh, there is a good workflow using Joman. Joman can create a skeleton application for you, there is a lot of generators for Joman, so you can create a plain web application, you can create an AngularJS-based application, you can create a, 
uh, AngularJS with Twitter Bootstrap or Backbone or whatever. Uh, using Bower, you can search dependencies, like I told you. So for instance, I want jQuery 1.8 or 1.9. And uh, using Grant, you will have a, a local server with live reloading, with um, uh, the ability to distribute your application and that sort of thing. And uh, this is extremely, let's say extremely, um, it's really good for the developer, for a front-end developer to use this, this tool compared with the, the other approach. I will, uh, if I have time, I will show you a little demo about using these tools and how the development experience is that you can compare with the server side. So, the next point of view, the second point of view is uh, the, uh, the architectural point of view. So let me talk to you about REST. This is, I mean, in 2014, REST should be familiar to everybody. And this is a just random sample over the internet. So we have a client, we have a server with an endpoint exposed. We send some sort of JSON to the server and we receive back a JSON response. Is that correct? Is that REST? Yes or no? Yes? Is there anything else that we should consider about REST? Who thinks that we should care about something else, not only just that? Nobody? That's correct. Very good point. And also the, the parameters that you can use, not in, in the body, but in the, the array, to do query parameters, because it's not the same query that can be checked. Yeah, that's a very good point. In this case, well, you can, if it's a JSON payload, you should put it in the, say, yeah, this is actually a, a query, so it should be a get, uh, talking about rest, but, um, I'm thinking about something else. So, anybody else wants to say something? No. Sorry? HTOS, yes, yes. That's, yeah, that's one of the points. So, uh, HTOS is, um, that stands for, for uh, hypermedia as the application state or something like that. Uh, so, brief description about HTOS. Uh, the hypermedia in a JSON response means that your, uh, your, your responses should be navigable and you should be pointing links to the resources you are returning in the response. So imagine, the, uh, this is not a good example, but imagine we have the typical example of a book uh, which has several authors, right? So imagine that JSON has a book with the title and release date and whatever. And we have an embed collection with the authors, right? Instead of giving in that response the author JSON as, a as an array of elements, what I would do is that if I want to follow the HTS principles, I will give an href, which is basically the URL resource for each, every author on that book, right? Uh, that's the let's say the, the idea in principle, although there are, there are some tweaks for that because in terms of per performance, it's not feasible to, you know, to every um, relationship I have, not returning the, the body, but that uh, URL, because then I will need to make an, a different request for that. But more or less, that's the, the idea. It's a good point, but I'm thinking about something else. So probably all of you will agree with me if I say that, REST is much more than uh, returning JSON, right? So uh, REST is not only JSON, however the JSON is formatted using HTS or not. So uh, to create a RESTful application is to, according to the Wikipedia, to be client server, stateless, cacheable, and Layer. Those are the basic principles about the RESTful uh, architecture. 
And the trickiest one is that one, right? Because cl client server is clear, it's uh, understandable. Uh, cacheable is something that we understand how to do it. We can implement a cache in server side or different places. It's already layered, so it's okay. But to achieve this statelessness is the most difficult part. So think about, for a while, about those full stack frameworks. They are heavily based on the HTTP session. So uh, for instance, for the authentication, if you authenticate to, to an application built with a, a server-side MVC framework, uh, you will be using the HTTP session for that. And that's essentially, that states, that's stateful, right? So you're not using REST if you're doing that. Um, so the HTTP session, as you probably already know, is basically that data structure where you store all the um, session-related information for a given user, for a particular user, right? So for instance, if I, uh, the next request I make to that application, they will remember me because I'm passing a J session ID or PHP session ID or whatever. So the server side will behave differently to two different kind of requests, right? That's the definition of being stateful. And uh, so to be stateless, and if we think about what REST means, REST means uh, representational state transfer. And uh, I want to emphasize that's ST ending, right? So state transfer means that on every single request, the client, client sorry, needs to transfer its state to, to, uh, to the server on each call. Right? And there are, there are ways to, to do that. Um, so for instance, uh, to give you an example, how would you achieve statelessness for an authentication system? Because um, I would like to, you know, we need to enforce security in our applications. So if we are not using an HTTP session, how would you do that? There are several tricks uh, you can do, but there is one specification called JSON Web Token. So for instance, you could, uh, the first time a user is connecting to your application, you could uh, generate, sign, and encrypt his session and send back into a cookie, right? So if you do that, the client will be securely transmitting to you in every request his state, his session. The difference is that instead of being stored on the server side, will be stored on the client side and it's signed and encrypted, so it's going to be secure. A JSON Web Token is a draft from the IATF. So, um, break down your applications. That's the very first step. Uh, you need to separate the front end from the back end. Uh, in that case, the front end would be a pure JavaScript in HTML5 uh, application, and the back end just a REST API. So uh, the very basic uh, scenario will be something like this, right? So uh, my users are connecting to a peer front end application. That's essentially a bunch of uh, JavaScript and HTML files. Think about how easily can you deploy that? Because it has nothing else to, I mean, just a, an Apache web server will be able to, to serve that. Think about how easily can you redeploy that? Think about uh, how easily can you scale that? I mean, you can scale it to, to the, uh, like they say, to the infinite and beyond, right? Um, because essentially the client, lo the, the MVC logic is executed not on your servers, but on the clients. And on the other hand, you will be exposing the REST API uh, behind the firewall or outside the DMS zone. So uh, we can, uh, making more complex scenario here. Um, the picture doesn't look readable, but I will explain to you. So in this case, we have a more complex uh, architecture. We have our front end over there. It's the same thing, right? It's something you 
uh, basically serve using a pure web server. You have an internal REST API over here, and this is basically uh, exposing a set of microservices. Have you ever heard about microservices? It's the buzzword of the year, so you will hear about that uh, over and over, microservices. The idea about microservices is that um, instead of having big applications serving uh, JSON, you just create little applications. They only take one concern, one responsibility, one single responsibility, and they expose that as, as microservices. Uh, the idea about microservices is also about how are they deployed. So they are deployed like Unix processes, right? So uh, it's a change in the way we usually deploy application. We don't have, we no longer have uh, servlet containers or stuff like that to, to deploy them. So uh, we expose them like processes, listener report, and um, on top of that, you can create a, a REST API. And uh, if you do that, you will have two different consumers. You may have two different cons consumers. One would be your front end, and the other one could be a public REST API for, for instance, your end users, consumers, or partners, or whatever. So the a scenario I described is called single page applications. Single page applications uh, means basically that all the interactions are happening in the browser, right? So if you use AngularJS or anything like that, the MVC in the client, the MVC in the browser, that's called single page because you don't have full page refreshes, right? Um, you are able to deploy the UI and the API separately and think about that, right? So you can redeploy as many tests as you want. You can do A-B testing really easily. Um, you also have better scalability, and that's a really uh, tricky thing. Because to, to scale something using Apache is way more easier than scale a bunch of uh, cluster of Tomcats or whatever, right? Uh, separation of responsibilities. So if you really have front-end and back-end developers and not real full stack, you can say them. The back-end, you have to do a REST API. So do it the best way you can do it. Do it fast, do it robust, do it secure. And they will concentrate on doing that because that kind of people feels more comfortable on the back-end. They are more com comfortable using or creating backend applications. And on the other hand, if you put a front end developer working on a server side framework, you will mess everything up because those guys are not used to, uh, they will have to have the framework installed locally to run the application. It's way more um, slow, slower to, to run the application. So the development experience in, is not that good. And they can start in parallel. That's a different thing, right? So you can uh, parallelize your development, and the front-end developers can create a fully functional application without the backend ready at all, because they can use mocks of the responses, right? And once the API is ready, they can just wire to the um, production version. Another advantage, advantage of this approach is that you can easily expose an API and you're, because you're basically doing that for your web application. So the web application would be your first consumer, but you get ready for having different consumers. So you can have mobile applications or back office applications or whatever you want. Um, there you have uh, an example of an application which is uh, breaking down. Uh, how many time left? We have 10 minutes, cool. So uh, there we have an application breaking down in, that's in GitHub or Bitpacket, I don't remember. Uh, I will show you how the development experience is with this.
what I have here is uh, a, a, a small application uh, broken down. So I have uh, Grails on the backend. Who knows Grails, by the way? Oh, very few people. Uh, Grails is an MVC framework for Groovy. Uh, Groovy is a JVM language. We have the backend there, and we have the frontend using Grant. So I will try to demonstrate in this slow resolution window how the development experience is. I have on my ID the, uh, the application code, right? So uh, this code is basically, uh, this is an HTML file which is uh, consuming the, the backend um, uh, API that is running on the, on, the, on the other port. So I don't know, well, it's really hard to, to see here, but the front end is running on port uh, 9000 and the backend is running on port 8080. So the development experience is, is really sweet because I have type something here and I save, it's reloaded automatically. I don't have to do anything else, right? Uh, starting the front end is really fast, right? So it only took to me how much? Mm, five seconds, three seconds, right? Uh, in this case, the backend is also fast because it's a really simple application, but you know how the real applications are, right? So backend applications take 30 seconds or so, and even if you have a slow hardware, it's even worse. Uh, you have things like German to do um, well let me first of all so do you see this that part of the URL that hash bank that's basically the routing is happening inside the client application. It's not going to the server. So the server is just serving this slash, the root of the application. Uh, the server is receiving the bunch of HTML and JavaScript files, and then everything else is handled on the client side. So if I want to create a different controller uh, or whatever, we can use Angular for that. And let's say, right, I want to create a new uh, controller for, for casinos, right? A list of casinos. It's uh, to say that. Uh, so Yeoman is offering you scaffolding, so you can generate uh, an empty, well, it modifies your route to handle that, in, that new URL. It creates a controller, uh, an empty test, and the view for you. So if I enter casinos here, right, we have my, um, everything is wired, right? So. I could go down to the view. I replace this. Hello, code motion. So to wrap everything up. Five minutes. Uh, think whether your team or company has full stack developers or not. That's the, the, the first question you need to ask yourselves. So if you ask that question to yourselves, maybe you will find out that your uh, theoretically full stack developers are not that kind of developers, and they will be uh, more pleased to do really backend only and have expert people doing the front end. Uh, think also if your team needs to scale, and that's an interesting thing. So uh, having full stack developers may scale for, for a uh, certain amount of work, but if you need to have really scalable development, uh, if you break down your applications, you will have 
see uh, the front-end work and the back-end work doing in parallel. From a restful point of view, you need to achieve statelessness. Think about that. Uh, and to do that, you need to avoid uh, server-centric uh, full-stack frameworks. So the best, easy, the best way to do that, to achieve that, is break down your applications into a front-end and a back-end. I don't know if you have any question so far. Yes, wonder. No, it's, uh, so the question is uh, if by microservices I'm referring to Heroku or stuff like that. So uh, microservices is a service you create internally in your application, right? So instead of, it's basically a way of uh, breaking down your uh, monolithic, your big applications into a small set of microservices, each one running on a different IP and port. That's the rough idea about them. Any other question, yes? Yeah, the question is if the microservices are different from SOA. And the answer is no. So none of this is new. The people are just giving you know, new names to, to make it um, to, to look better for the people, right? But the, the idea behind having a REST API and a front end separately is not new at all. But it's something which is becoming trendy. And the microservices is just a buzzword to, uh, I recognize I have to admit that there is a difference in the way you deploy them. Right, so as I told you, uh, there's people uh, packaging microservices as uh, RPM packages or Debian packages or stuff like that, or they treat them like Unix services. And uh, depending how big they are, that's another difference with SOA, because SOA just, and well, and SOA has a lot of shit, you know, the, the bus and stuff like that. You don't have that in, in microservices. The, the idea behind them is that you have a small pieces of, of services running and exposing uh, information for uh, for other things. So on top of that, you should uh, you should create something to to uh, orchestrate them all in an API. And th think about that. For so, for instance, imagine I have an API uh, which is returning information from different sources, right? So you can parallelize that using any concurrent library you wish. And for instance, I could make parallel requests to the different backends, all right? combine them all in a single JSON res uh, response and return that back to the client. So that's going to be faster than having a single responsibility, sorry, a single application with all the responsibilities inside. Any more questions? Thank you. That's Emile.